Hey, future badass business owners, welcome back to the Start a Small Business podcast, where each episode we will be walking you through the process of getting your small business from concept to open for business. In this episode, we are going to continue our discussion on research. In the last episode, we talked about all things competition. And in this episode, we're going to focus on the rest of what you should be researching. Now, just to highlight the last episode, we focused on doing your research when it comes to your competition. We discussed what are their products and services, what are they charging for them, what their reputation is, how to do their marketing, and other key facts that you will want to know, both good and bad, because both are going to give you a leg up on them out the gate. But here in part two of our research topic, we're going to dive into all the other things that you will need to be researching as part of your journey into opening your new small business. Now, don't forget to grab that downloadable checklist I mentioned in the show notes. Now, before we jump into the legal stuff, I want to talk about some research that you need to do about the trade area that you plan to serve. If you plan on having a brick and mortar business, statistically, your trade area is no more than about five miles from around your business, unless you are a destination place that folks will seek out and drive even further. For example, those remote areas will drive hours and hours to spend the day at a local area and go to the Walmart and all of their favorite haunts. Odds are, though, you're not this type of business, so you are more than likely sticking to the five-mile rule. So when determining a location, make sure that you are looking at the five miles around where you plan to put your store, because that is potentially going to be the clients and the customers that are most likely to use you. Each business is different. When I had my ice cream shot, it was great because it was only single family homes within the five mile radius. However, it was also surrounded by a bunch of businesses and those businesses surrounding me are not going to be my primary demographic. Here's another example. If you were starting a garage door repair business and the five miles around you all have carports, that's not going to be a great business location as well because they don't have any garage doors. Now, this doesn't mean that you're not going to get people from 10 or even 15 miles away, but the further away from your business, the less likely you are to get those people. Now, for everybody else, I really want you to pay attention to this five mile radius because what happens is a lot of times people will grow their business and say, I'll go 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away, a half hour drive away and everything else. The further you drive, the further you go out, the less likely you will be able to make as much money as you think you're going to make. Yes, it is a sale, but your costs also go up because your gas is going up and your time is going up. And the further away you go and run all over the place, that means that's probably one less job that you can do locally. In the beginning, people tend to go all over the place. I get it. You're trying to get the business off the ground, but I promise you, if you focus on that five to seven miles within your current location, you're going to have the most success. There are usually plenty of people for your business. Way too many small businesses chase every dime versus focusing their energy on the thousands of homes that can be found in that five to 10 mile radius. Time is money. Wear and tear and gas is money. Unless your jobs are worth the extra time and gas and you can make thousands of dollars a pop, then 25 miles might make sense. But for most of you, because most of your jobs are $100 or less, with maybe $20, $25 in potential profit, you're much better off sticking closer to home. And besides, it's much easier to dominate a smaller marketplace than a larger one. Now, I talk about the five mile radius more in depth over on the Badass Business Soda podcast. So if you want to learn more about it, head over there and check out that episode. We want you to focus on being the number one at what it is that you do in your own backyard. All right, let's jump into more things that you need to be researching. Special requirements of the business, such as training or certifications. Since each business is slightly different, some of them are going to require that you have a special certification or specialized training. Sometimes this will be directed by the state, the county, or the city, and other times by the profession itself. For example, in some areas, a dog groomer needs to have certain training hours and certifications in the field in order to open the business. And in other states, they don't need anything at all. Although I do recommend that you have some experience. Trust me, those dogs would appreciate not being your first customers if you have no experience. So make sure that you are checking to find out if you have to have any specialized training or certifications. Now, the best areas to check for this are government websites, as well as the core websites for your particular profession that you are entering. There are usually some accredited certification people that you are required to be a part of. Google is great for this type of research, as well as speaking to others that are already doing the business that you're in. 
and they might be willing to share what they did or who they'd recommend. And by the way, if you're having trouble getting information from those that are local to you, just drive 10, 15 minutes outside of town to another area, and more than likely, they're going to be willing to talk to you. People love talking about their business, just not necessarily to their competition. Now, this can be very helpful. For example, I had a friend who was thinking of becoming a home inspector at one point, and I got him hooked up with a few local home inspectors to get more information, as well as the schooling that he would be required to have. He researched all week all the needs and costs associated with this transition, and today, as of this recording, he is three years into this business, and he's very successful at it. Yet he continues to do his research on specialty areas that he wants to add to his business and he is making a killing by becoming a specialist on a lot of things other home inspectors cannot do. He knows the power of doing his research. So make sure you do your research on any special requirements that your new business is going to require. Now you also need to look at the licensing needed by your city, your county, and your state. So your first stop is to stop at the city hall or your county offices and make sure that you check out your state's website. You will probably need a license to run your business. Each of these areas will have different requirements, so make sure that you check with each of them on any special licensing that you will need. Some cities don't need you to register at all, and other cities absolutely need you to do it, and there is a fine attached if you do not have it. Some will have simple registrations, and others will have more detailed applications. Don't forget the county. That is one that a lot of people miss. And a lot of times the county will oversee the different cities and require that even though the city doesn't require it, the county does. So it's important that you check with all three, city, county, and state on anything that you need to have in order to run your business. And by the way, they usually have some great resources at these different places that can help you out. You also need to look into what taxes you're going to need to collect. So while you're checking on your licensing, make sure to also ask them about any taxes that you need to collect at the time of your services. Brick and mortars almost always have a sales tax that they're going to have to do. But yet, some service-based businesses have to pay taxes as well. Some states don't tax services, other states do tax services. So it's really important that you understand your local community and what it is that you have to do. Please do not assume. Don't just listen to what your cousin Bob told you. Trust, but verify. The last thing I want you to do is to wake up one day and find out that you owe thousands of dollars in money that you never collected. Because there are different types of taxes out there that need to be collected. So you will want to make sure that you know exactly what your state and the government will be expecting from you each year when you file your taxes or each month in the case of a lot of county taxes and state taxes. Please do not skip this part. It's so difficult to get out of tax problems and these folks can put you in jail and take everything you worked hard to build. It's not worth it. And by the way, this is a side note and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you do not keep those taxes. You are just a holding. You are collecting the taxes for these entities and then you turn around and give them back usually the following month. So please do not put them with your funds you need to make sure that that money is set aside separately so that way you always have it to pay because it's not your money. So do not spend any taxes that you collect in the business. It can get you into a lot of trouble. Now, another area that the government websites are going to be a great help for you on are any permits that you might need. Once again, this can be done when you're visiting these local areas. Sometimes you might need a permit for the building that you're going to be in or a permit to work outside of your vehicle, especially if you are taking your business to somebody's house. Some businesses require permits to set up shop on the streets. For example, a snow cone business using a parking space. You're probably going to need a permit to be able to do that. I've even heard of some folks needing a permit if they use water as part of their business. For example, a hair or a dog groomer who takes their business on the road and they're having to use the water, they have to have a permit. Whatever it is, you need to make sure that you know exactly what you need to have permits for, so this way you are always covered. And don't forget, if you are doing anything with food at all, you will definitely be required to have permits in order to serve the public in any way, shape, or form. Plus, there is special training that they will require you to take, so this way you don't make people sick. So you need to make sure that you get that as well. I'm not just talking restaurants either. I even had to do one for my ice cream shop, even though we never served hot food. And it is a crazy course that you have to take. So don't assume, make sure you verify what it is that you have to have and what you don't have to have. 
So recap, when you're speaking to the city, county, and state, I want you to make sure that you're asking about your licensing, your permits, and your taxes, as well as any special training that might be required. Now, another area that you're going to look into is your insurance. You need to find out what type of insurances you might need. You will probably need some general liability insurance to cover you since you will have some type of interaction with people and you're going to need to cover your liability, especially when you're working with these people or you're in other people's homes. You will also need insurance on all brick and mortar businesses. Your landlord will let you know the amount that they are going to require. Don't be shocked if they ask for a million dollar policy. If you're a franchise, they will also have a minimum that they want you to carry and they're going to want to be on your policy. So make sure you ask and do your research. Remember, both your landlord and your franchisee want to protect their assets just as much as you do. If you are going to have employees, you're going to have certain insurances that you're going to need to have as well, including workers' comp. So it's important that you make sure you dive into this area and have the adequate coverage to meet all the requirements needed. Let's talk about bonding. Not all businesses will need to be bonded. If it's an industry standard, then you're probably going to need to do it. Will it allow you to get paid more? Do your homework on this one. There are quite a few businesses that require you to be licensed and bonded, so it's important you know if your business is one of them. Another area that you need to check are your zoning laws and any other regulations. So when you're checking with the city, the county, and the state, make sure you check out any zoning laws or regulations that they're going to require your business to comply with. Make sure you let them know where you plan to run your business. Is it a brick and mortar, running it out of your vehicle, out of a pull-along trailer? Whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're zoned correctly for whatever they need. Never assume. Now, if you plan to lease out a building or a brick and mortar, you have a whole lot of other research that you're going to need. Now, I'm not going to cover everything, but I want to make sure that you know that there's a lot more research that you need to do prior to opening up that business. In addition to all the items we've covered earlier, there are tons of costs and needs for leasing a space. Location is huge, and that definitely needs to be researched like we talked about in our five mile radius earlier. Leasing costs can vary from shopping center to shopping center, even if the two are across the street from each other. For example, in my town, we have three major shopping centers across and side by side, and their price per square foot can vary dramatically. Now, it might be due to the landlord feeling the space is worth a certain amount of money per square foot, or it may be that they have a better main anchor store, big box retail that's in there, that drives more business than others. A Walmart or a main grocery store is worth way more than a hobby store as the anchor. More cars are driving into that parking lot, so you're going to find that the lease amount is going to be much higher. At the end of the day, you want to be where your customers are, but you also need to make sure that you have enough money that you can pay for it. Now, if you plan to do a mobile business or run a business out of your vehicle, you're going to have other costs associated with this. And this includes gas insurance and a bunch of other things. So it's really important that you look into what it is that you need to have in those particular areas, especially now that more and more businesses are being run out of vehicles going to the customer versus them coming to you at a brick and mortar. We are starting to see a lot more mobile dog groomers, mobile glass repair, mobile food trucks, all kinds of things being taken on the road and going to the customers where traditionally people went to a brick and mortar. It saves you a lot of money. Don't be in a hurry to get in a brick and mortar. If you can do it another way, it'll be much cheaper. But then again, in order to do this type of business, you'll want to verify the rules that your city, county, and state have. There are some businesses where they will not let you do that. You will also want to make sure that you look up all the costs associated with this type of delivery. For example, what is it going to cost you for the vehicle? Do you need a trailer or a box truck? What special equipment are you going to need? How much gas are you typically going to go through every single month? Are you going to need any special insurance? please make sure you jot down all the different questions that you need to ask and do your research. I do not want you to spend crazy amounts of money on these vehicles unless you've run the numbers to make sure that you can pay for it. I promise you it's going to be much higher of a cost than you think it's going to be. My main mission is to keep you debt free. So it's really important that you look at how you can possibly do this as debt free as possible. I know sometimes you're going to have to do it, but you need to make sure that it can pay for itself relatively quickly. Once again, a great research if you plan to do one of these types of businesses are asking other people that are doing the business currently. What do they wish they would have known when they first started? Once again, go out of your area if you need to. Google them, call them up on the phone, go to another state if you need to on the by Googling and just saying, hey, I'm thinking about doing this in my state. Is there anything that you can tell me? 
believe it or not, you might have a few people that won't tell you, but every once in a while, you're going to find someone who's going to give you some good information. Now, another area that you're going to need to do your research on are your costs for products and equipment that you're going to need. No matter what your business is, you will have products or equipment that's needed. From the low end of saying a window cleaning business where you only need squeegees and a bucket to a pizzeria that needs a giant oven and topping stations. Not to mention all the little things that you're going to need to help that are going to add up. You will want to make a detailed list of everything your new business is going to require that you have, and you need to know what all those costs are. Plus, how do you plan to pay for them? We will go into more detail in a later episode about financing your new business, but here you want to get an idea of what you are looking at. Now, important thing to keep in mind when you are working this section of your research, there are two buckets to put things in, the must-have bucket and the like-to-have bucket. The must-have items are those things that you must have in order to start the business. For example, a handyman will need a screwdriver and a hammer, but he doesn't necessarily need a drill press out the gate. As most jobs are going to require that screwdriver and hammer, very few are going to require that drill press. All you have to do is keep a list of those items that you can purchase along the way as you reinvest money back into the business in order to grow it. What do you need right away? And what do you need to get within the first six months to a year? And definitely don't go chasing stuff that you do not need at this time. Those are for way later down the road. I don't want you spending money you do not have. And by the way, in many cases, you can also rent them from your local Home Depot or from other companies if you need them for a particular job. So instead of you spending the hundreds and thousands of dollars on some of that equipment, you can go rent it for 50 bucks over the weekend and get the same thing done. And it's going to be much cheaper for you. So make sure that you dive in to the costs that you're going to have to get the business off the ground and then some things that you can get later on. Now, I want to talk about one more area, and that is all the startup costs for your business. This is where you're going to brainstorm any other items that you will need to dive into that we haven't talked about yet. Think of things that don't fall into other buckets. For example, if you plan to have employees, you will need to have a section on what it's going to take to hire them, train them and pay them. Are you going to use a payroll service or do it yourself? What taxes do you need to hold? How do you plan to find folks? Now, I'm not going to dive in deep into this particular thing. Yes, we'll have an episode on people later, but it's something you need to jot down the research that you need to do if you're planning on hiring some people. It's important that you think of all the startup costs that you're going to have. Research on the various suppliers that you plan to use, for example. Research on seasonal swing periods of the year. What categories sell the best during the different quarters of the year? Dive into the various ways that you can market your business. As you can see, there's all kinds of stuff that you're going to want to get out there and research. If a question pops into your head, write it down so you can do the research. Now, please, whatever you do, do not skip your research. I know I said this before, and I cannot stress it enough. By skipping any parts of your research, you risk costing yourself tons of money and learning the hard way. While this will not be the sexy part of starting your new business, it is an important part and probably the most important part of starting your business and saving you time and money. So please, whatever you do, do your research. And don't forget, there is a checklist in the show notes that you can use to help you with staying on track with the different types of research that you need to do. Now, in our next episode, we're going to talk about researching your ideal customers and what pain points you plan to solve for them. You're not going to want to miss that one. It's one of the most important things that you can do in your new business. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and check out the Badass Business Owner YouTube channel where we'll walk you through all kinds of stuff, not only to get your business started, but once you get your business up and running, things you're going to need to know really well. All right, with that, I'm going to see you on the next episode. Bye for now.